Carl and Liam here from Games, Brains and Headbanging Life, GBHBall.com for sure. And it's We Are Afraid of the Dark. You know how this goes by now. We're up to episode number six of the Are You Afraid of the Dark TV series, season one, The Tale of the Super Specs. Ignore the dumb name. It's a bit more interesting than that. Directed by Ron Oliver and written by Chloe Brand. There's a clue. Uh, not spoilers, but I got to say at the start, this is one of my favorites so far. I think this is really imaginative stuff, and I think it's really, really fun as well. And uh, coincidentally, Ron Oliver returns as director, and it was like, oh, okay, there's a clue. It's always a good uh, seal of uh, knowing that it's going to be a decent episode is when you see his name attached, it seems. <laughs> agreed, agreed. Uh, right, so we got a cast. we got Eugene Bird as Weeds, uh, Gradine, Levy Vled, Amiro as Mary Beth, Richard Dumont as Sardo, Rachel Glatt as the Dark Lady slash Phantom, Carol Ann Gascoigne as Patty, Annette Buzou as Catherine, Errol Tenenbaum as Mark, Paul Frappier as Alternative Worlds Weeds, and Tara Anik as Arlene, the Alternative Worlds, Worlds Mary Beth. And you think an Alternative Worlds? It's like they're only in like one brief scene at the end, those two, but uh, I thought it was worth mentioning because they're, they're fun. I feel like we've had quite a few character, strange, odd character names up to this point, and weeds can be added to that collection. <laughs> it has been an unusual little run, and it, I, I actually did check. I was like, I saw it in like the wiki, and was like, nah, that's got to be a misprint. Can't be called weeds. All right, I realize it's a nickname, but nobody ever explains why he has a nickname called weeds. <laughs> Draw your own conclusions, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, this is Gary's first story, but it does come with a caveat, and now it has a bracket next to it, and the bracket is on screen. And the reason why is the introduction to this episode will imply that where stories are being told off screen, which I thought was unusual. That is unusual, but also it's great to see Gary finally step up as the leader of the group, tell a story, everyone else has been doing it. Also, if my memory serves me right, actually, every time Gary does step up, it almost is a, you know, it's going to be good <laughs> type situation. Ooh, I hope that's the case then, because this is our first one for him and it is a strong start. Um, but there's a lot of other firsts for this episode. It is the only episode where one member of the Midnight Society is missing, absent throughout the storytelling. And that character is David. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's also the only episode to have a scene before the introduction. Hmm. Hmm. This episode marks the first appearance of Sardo. He will be a reoccurring character. Iconic, man. <laughs> I, I do love him. I do love him. Uh, this is also the first episode which had the opening that would be used throughout the remainder of the series. So adding the shots of the moored boat, the moving playground swing, the house and attic, the storm, a door threatening banging, starting to open and a hand holding a match. You forget that this iconic stuff that you know from the Are You Afraid of the Dark sequence actually hasn't existed up to this point. Also, I have to say, I appreciate you just calling him Sardo, not Mr. Sardo, which oh, is something yeah, I did it. Great oh, I just did it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, you're right, uh, absolutely. Um, believe, and it seems... Gonna, go on. Well, I was going to throw out one thing here, I believe it or not, I don't know if you're aware, but very far down the line in these runner episodes, we do get an episode containing both Sardo and Dr. Vink, which is a pretty cool moment. I look forward to that. I I, I don't, I can't, I, I don't remember it don't remember at all but then i don't remember really a lot and i i don't remember a lot this episode either i remember the character of sardo that's the mm. one thing i did remember so maybe i have seen it maybe uh or i see one way it appears in a later episode um but it seems likely and there's no like definitive proof about this but it seems likely that the concept of this episode is inspired or referencing the wonderful 1998 horror film they live mm. I think that's a very good possibility. <laughs> have you seen They Live? I have, yeah. Do you like They Live? I do. <laughs> yeah, love it. I love it. Love. I think I think Roddy Piper is amazing in it. I actually watched it not too long ago, only about a year or two ago. Yeah, it's good stuff. It's aged actually really well. Yeah, and I still remember being the first time I saw it and being absolutely stunned to realise that was not Duke Nukem's catchphrase. That's very true. And it's I think the message of it is probably more relevant than ever. So, yeah, I'm left. Yeah. Yeah, good God, absolutely. Okay, so the episode begins with Kirsten visiting Gary in his dad's magic shop at 
So like, that's weird. But throw this in for extra weirdness. It's daytime. What? And Gary's not wearing glasses. What? Well, then it's a prop, Gary. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> um, he scares her into thinking he cut off his left index finger with a mini mini guillotine. Oh, Gary, you, go- you goof. And then he reveals that this is the shop where he gets most of his ideas to tell his stories. Which makes sense. Inspiration. Mm. Then it turns into a weird direction as Kirsten tells him that some of the others are saying that his stories haven't been very scary recently. And like, this seems to bother him because even just the whole like, who's been saying that? And then she's like, oh, I don't want to say that kind of thing. And she brushes it off, picking up a pair of glasses that he calls super specs. And apparently they give you x-ray vision, you know, joke specs, basically. They debate the realism of magic and he assures her that he is full of surprises. And then the glasses, in a, in a weird shot, the glasses disappear in a puff of smoke. It's like, okay, was that him doing that or was that just for us? <laughs> that evening at the Midnight Society's meeting, Eric complains that Gary is slipping. And you know what I'm beginning to think here? They are all bitches. Every time pre the story, someone is moaning or having a dig at someone else. I, I mean, it's nice to have like that level of personality, but like, it's like, oh, you are bitches. He's not even here to defend himself. That's true. But also, it, it's kind of like funny they say that because of the, like our opinion kind of up to this point about the episode not being that scary. It's been kind of a criticism. So it's like they're self. That's like they're aware of it. It's like, a bit weird. <laughs> yeah, and Betty Betty and then claims Gary has told some of the best stories in the past, and there it is. There is your line that makes you go, ah, oh, okay. So it continues without us even being watching. Yeah, I mean, they obviously say, save the supposed best ones just for just for our viewership, but then maybe the really shit ones are left to the side then. <laughs> uh, Kiki walking backwards complains she doesn't know when the last time Gary really scared her was, but she bumps into Gary and obviously she jumps. And he apologises for being late and reveals that David is sick. Now, I was baffled over this at the start. I was like, wait, why why, why, why not have the character in it? Was he late? Did he, could he not get there? His flight was cancelled or anything like that? But then I re- it's it's not that guy. It's part of the story. He'll appear at the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gary tells, Eric tells Gary that Kiki thinks the stories have sucked lately. What a dick. I was like, what a prick. Kiki says, he asked them and Gary asked them to give him a shot tonight, revealing that his story is about three kinds of people. People who believe in magic, people who don't believe in magic and people who should believe in magic. I, I had to I stop and actually, w- w- wait, what? Believe in, don't believe in people who should. What's the should part? It's me. Submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society. It is the tale of the super specs. And we meet a teenager named Weeds. Uh, he loves magic and pulling pranks on people. And April's full day is coming up and he plans to go all out with it. So we've got this kind of prank character. Very goosebumps. Never seen that before. <laughs> Indeed. But he's showing his girlfriend, Mary Beth. And I was like, that's rare. How often do we actually get, and would, I guess rare in the context of us also including goosebumps here, to actually yeah. have uh, a teenager with a girlfriend on screen? Yeah, I don't think... I can't remember a single episode where it's been that dynamic. So Nope. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Because they normally just do a sibling. Just do a sibling or a friend. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so he's showing his girlfriend Mary Beth some of his stuff, which includes the dust of Denaron, Den- Den- which is apparently magic dust made from crushed monkey bones. And she is unimpressed, of course, wanting to go to the movies, but he kind of just ignores her and continuing to show some of his tricks. Powder monkey bones. You know, crucial every you spell. I thought we were going to the movies. Later, later, I'm casting a spell. Oh, sorry. Let's see. Oh, here it is. The spell of the second sight. Umbu Tubu Sunrage. Vinsu Guru Bambane. What are you doing? I don't know. It's just some kind of voodoo spell. We get fast-paced moving at this start for some reason as he reads an incantation and throws some dust in the air. The dust lands onto a bunch of glasses he has, which are the same glasses that Gary has, the X-ray super spec ones. And we see them glow when the magic dust lands on them. Uh, And Weeds is completely unaware that anything happened, but obviously we saw that. So we're kind of like, okay, something's going on there. Yeah. Mm. 
We then get a moment of like, oh, okay, this is deep. Mary Beth is annoyed. And she begins to question his commitment to their relationship because of his lack of maturity. I was like, well, hold on, man. You've got like 20 minutes to do this episode. You ain't got time for this shit. <laughs> that's, that's pretty big stuff for uh, Eye for the Dark. <laughs> Indeed. But then she follows it up by saying they've been they've been going out for two weeks. And I was just <laughs> kind of like, whoa, whoa, you need to calm the hell down, Mary Beth. Two weeks. As teenagers. <clears throat> but as if to prove a point, he get he find, he laughs over a whoopee cushion. I was like, it's nothing, <laughs> you know, they could be funny. Yeah, in the right time and place, you know. Yeah. It now turns out they're in a shop, though, as we see they're in a, a place basically owned by the flamboyant. And that's the one I'm going to use from flamboyant magic shopkeeper Sardo. He comes out from the back, wants them to leave because they're not going to buy anything. And of course, it's not Sardo. We should say this. It's Mr. Sardo with an accent on the dough. We do say <laughs> that a lot. He is. Let's just get this out here. He is similar to Dr. Vink. We have an adult here who gets the memo, knows what he's in, and basically is going to try and chew the scenery up a bit. It's going to be, it's over the top, it's silly, mm -hmm. but it's very memorable because of it. Come, come. Playtime's over. Bye now or bye now. Okay, Mr. Sardo. I'll take uh, it's Sardo. No Mr. Accent on the dough. Yeah, look, um, I'll take these and the monkey bones too. Ah. Yeah, it's always a highlight when he appears on screen. I think he is, you know, he just plays it, he gets the memo, he's delivering that classic uh, adult eccentric performance that you want from, from these characters. And yeah, he's very memorable, so he does a good job. Who did he remind you of? Did he remind you of anyone? Because there's someone I couldn't stop thinking because he kind of looks like him, but some of his behavior as well. You always remind me a little bit of um, Tim Curry. I don't know. If there, it the is. Uh, there, there it is. There it is. The fact yeah. that we both, yeah, we both got it. Yeah, I got a little bit of Tim Curry from him as well. Exactly. Uh, so Weeds decides to buy the magic powder, but then finds the super specs and puts a pair on. So Sado, talking about the specs, convinces Weeds to buy them. Mary Beth tries them on too, but then gets scared when she sees a person in dark clothing and with a dark mask on standing in the shop. And when she takes them off, they're gone. I was kind of like, oh, that's pretty cool. I like that. That that I thought that was kind of creepy. You see anything? No, it's stupid. What was that? What was what? Yeah, it's a nice nice visual. Hmm. Uh, school the next day, Weed starts playing some pranks. He tries to enchant a girl's yogurt, but is then confronted by them, and he kind of claims he's got no interest in pulling pranks this year. Uh, before leaving. When we see one of the girls eats the yogurts and her voice changes to being really high pitched. So seemingly Weed's magic trick worked, but he didn't see it because he already left. Yeah, Like spiking people's food, does he? <laughs> indeed, indeed. Because forget the fact that it's just, dude, you pour dust in someone's fucking yogurt. Mm. Uh, Weed is now playing a prank on his friend Mark, who opens his locker to get hit in the face with a punching glove. I childishly laughed at this when I laughed when that happened. I went, Matt. So I felt like a child for that. I mean, that takes some effort to set up that kind of prank. So I think it's it's okay to laugh a little bit. <laughs> agreed, agreed. Uh, Weeds laughs along and Mark notices the specs he's wearing. Mary Beth then comes along and takes them, telling Mark what they are before she puts them back on again. And as she looks around, she sees a mysterious woman now wearing all in black, standing in a hallway with a book. Once again, when Mary Beth takes them off, she's gone. I really like that as well. I like the the whole standard of holding a book. It left me intrigued. I couldn't remember what happened. So I'm like, what's going on here? Mm, yeah. These are magic glasses that make you look cool. They'd have to be magic to make weeds look cool. Don't I look cool or do I just look like a... What's the matter? I saw somebody, a strange woman. She tells Weeds and Mark what she saw, but of course she, they just think she's trying to prank them. Uh, outside she insists, so she puts the specs on again and she sees the woman standing near a tree. Weeds still does not believe her. He puts them on and sees nothing. Back and forth, Mary Beth then puts them back on. And this time she sees the woman, but the woman gestures for her to come over. And rightfully this frightens Mary Beth who screams and throws them in the bin. 
I thought that was effectively scary. Like um, you kind of got to put yourself in a mind frame. What if you could see someone standing there and nobody else could, and that figure clearly saw you too? That's true. You can see that how that'd be scary. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, we demark are playing basketball and the form is losing. He sprinkles some dust on the basketball quietly, but still misses his shot. And as they walk away, Weeds having lost and owes Mark some soda, the betting soda, basically. He throws the ball backwards, making an instant basket. So it's quite a shot. Um, they kind of stop and like look and like, oh, did that go in? And think, oh, no, it didn't. And so on. But what I thought was, forget all of that. That's just a scene. What I thought was weird was, did they not want their basketball? They just walk off and leave it. I think it's true. Yeah. It's not cheap. No. Elsewhere, Mary Beth is walking and talking with her fa- friend Catherine. She's telling Catherine about her recent experiences with the specs. Uh, but Catherine, rightfully and really cleverly, I thought, go suggests it's probably weeds pranking her. And I was like, yeah, you know what, man, that, that would be quite clever. All right, it's probably not possible, you know, but like the idea of there being someone, I'll uh, follow her around for a bit and scare her. Yeah. Uh, if he, if he managed to like turn that into an actual prank, then he did deserve a hell of a lot of credit. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, Mary Beth goes into a bag, but finds the specs in there. Much to her surprise, she did throw them away. So she decides, you know what? I'm just going to return on to Mr. Sardo. But when she gets there, it's closed. So she puts them through the letterbox. Of course, you can kind of guess what's going to happen. She goes home and finds them in a bag again. Looks like there's no getting away from them. So this is one of my favorite scenes of the show here. I think this is really cleverly done here. She decides to put them on again. And I think I can buy into that. Regardless of the kind of creepy vibes you got before, the temptation to try and understand and in the safety of your own home, you'd be mm. like, yeah, let me put them on and see what I see this time. You could, you could see how you could obsess over the idea of these beings being there, even though you can't see them, you know, and you're wanting to see them. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, and through the spec, she sees like a golden kettle steaming on the stove. And I thought, okay, that was, I was like, all right, so it's sort of dimensional. She might be seeing into an alternative dimension. Particularly, she gets close to it. She notices it's not really there. It kind of shimmers. And then she's able to sort of move her hand through it. I thought it was a really effective effect. Yeah, look good. Uh, no, and Tree, she continues to look around the house and she sees a fire burning in a fi- the fireplace. When she takes the glasses off, it's completely, obviously, empty fireplace. Cool touch. Um, but the arrival of the Lady in Black stops the exploration and Mary Beth decides to interact with her, asks her who she is. But the woman just points past her and then we see more dark beings beginning to appear behind her. They start to walk towards Mary Beth, vanish when she takes the specs off. She then puts them back on. They're getting closer. So naturally, at this point, Mary Beth says, fuck this, and just runs off screaming. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm down for that, because that would make you'd realise, right? And I think that's what's scary. Take them off, they're gone. Put them back on, they're getting closer. You'd realise in your head they're not gone. They're not gone. You just can't exactly. see them anymore. Yeah, exactly. Fuck that, yeah. Gone, man. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, annoyingly, back to the Midnight Society as Frank interrupts the story, suggesting that Mary Beth should have tried harder to destroy the glasses. And then you get Betty Ann questioning whether or not the apparitions were really there before Gary continues the story. Thanks for that. I needed that interruption of the flow. Way to kill the momentum. Indeed, indeed. So Mary Beth goes to find weeds. He's playing basketball with Mark again, and she desperately tries to explain about the figures in black. Desperate to prove she's telling the truth, she puts them back on again and a group in black appear they're playing basketball with a black ball right which i thought was initially silly but i think this is the most effective scare in the entire thing as they all just stop playing basketball and turn to her and begin to advance towards her and there's probably about eight to ten of them and i thought that was really creepy yeah i completely agree
Uh, the actor, the actor almost ruins it though, because she screams no in the cheesiest way. Like seriously, Ron, mm. tell her to do it again. It was Take not two. good. Take two. Mm -hmm. uh, she runs off, and Weeds acts a bit concerned, but he doesn't go after. And I was like, mate, you deserve that. That you, yeah, two weeks ain't gonna last if this is your behaviour. <laughs> Uh, Mayor Beth goes to Mr. Sardo's shop but finds it closed and bangs on the door calling him Sardo, which gets his attention. He doesn't want to let her in, thinking she wants a refund. So, you know, we got this vibe earlier on that he might be a little bit of a con artist. But yeah, yeah. it's getting stronger now. It's a funny reoccurring thing about how he has all these magic objects. He think he obviously believes he's just like a con artist selling these like, yeah, con items that don't actually do shit. And actually, it turns out they do. And if people come yeah. back to him, he's like, what the hell are you talking about? That's like a reoccurring funny thing. Yeah, Yeah, because she does reveal to him that the specs work and he invites her in. And inside, they realize that Weeds cast the spell of second sight onto the super specs and it enables the people who wear them to see beings living on Earth, but in another dimension. And Mr. Sardo explains that there are different beings that live among Earth, among humans, but we never see them because of these alternative dimensions. It is directly explained as that. It's it's pretty simple, and it's just explained like that. Uh, the mm. spell that was cast onto the specs also opened a window in her house. What? That I did. I thought that was dumb. I was like, there is no explanation for that. If the spell was cast in the shop, why would it have any effect on her house? Doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it doesn't really. But what it has done is allowed beings from a parallel universe to cross over and enter the real world. Some of these living beings are good. Some may be evil. And the evil ones may attempt to take over. Okay. Right. We're getting there. Uh, Sardo agrees to try after he's paid, been paid, though, to counter the spell. But he has run out of the dust as he sold the last pouch with the weeds. Meanwhile, we cut to weeds about to flush it down the toilet, thinking it's a ripoff. Uh, but Mary Beth and Sardo arrive just in time to stop him. We then cut to them, basically, sitting in a seance style position, planning to cast a spell. Sardo using a crystal ball and saying a magical chant. It is all done very silly here. It's designed to make you go, if you were involved in it, you'd be given each, looking at each other going, all right, mate, yeah, sure, this is real. Mm. But he does so th throw some dust and something does happen. The room starts to get dark, weird sounds are heard, and they seem to be transported as the crystal ball begins to glow. I really like the visual change here. And it's done in an instant. It goes like, woof. And then it's just surrounded by darkness. It's, it's, it's a well shot scene. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Mary Beth puts the specs on and loads sees loads of beings standing around. Um, and I love this scene because like, Weeds is like, take the glasses off, take the glasses off and all that. She's like, no, they're here, they're here, whatever. And he just goes, yeah, I know, I can see them too. Meaning mm. that they're not even necessary. And I was like, that's so good. Yeah, that is good. Me? My breath. They're here, I can see them. Take, take off the specs. But I can see them with the specs. You don't need them. I see them too. This isn't happening. Uh, Mr. Sardo begins to panic, but finds a spell to close the window and send them all back. It seems to work as the spell finishes and they all vanish. However, clearly something is off as Weeds, Mary Beth and Mr. Sardo are still in darkness. I was like, okay, that's cool. All right, so we know we're not quite there yet. And I was intrigued to see where this is going because it kind of felt like the obvious ending was just kind of like closed the window and maybe it's a close call, but they just get back and that's the end of it. But that's not where we go. They realize they're not safe as a big pair of eyes appear. And uh, Mr. Sardo, uh, freaking out, offers up the kids as payment. <laughs> as my jam, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's the lady in black, and she begins to speak, revealing that because they tampered with the cosmic seal, balance must be restored. The two universes can't exist on the same plane, so she must close off their universe. I have no idea what she's talking about. I really don't. It's like, wait, what? One minute it's a window open for people to cross over. Now you're suggesting that they're both trying to exist in the same dimensional plane? Yeah, bit of a stretch. Uh-huh, uh-huh. She begins to chant and a storm picks up. Mary Beth and Weeds hold on to each other to stop being sucked into it. As Mary Beth screams, 
we then cut back to normality like an instant number well done cut you're just like oh we're back yeah except that's not and this is where i think the episode really nails its ending we appear to be in, inside mary Beth's house However, it's not her house. It's the house of a girl named Arlene from the parallel universe, Dark Earth. She and an alternative form of weeds are there with the lady in black. It seems as though with that window open, they were thinking of Mary Beth as a ghost. So basically they were trying to get rid of Mary Beth as well. Both sides were trying to get rid of the other. And the lady in black now reveals that she trapped weeds Mary Beth and Mr. Sardo inside the dark world, and we see them visible in a crystal crystal ball. And it's a dark, it's an odd ending. It's a bit dark, it's a bit intriguing, a bit confusing, but I like I like the level of imagination that kind of went into Ooh. this. <laughs> Funny thing is, they were trying to get rid of you too. Are they gone for good? I don't think they'll be bothering you anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a high, like highly imaginative, like you said, and compared to some of the more simplistic endings that we've had from other episodes, it, get, it gets you like thinking and stuff like that. So, it's, yeah, it's good. I enjoyed it. And it's interesting because we go back to the Midnight Society and Gary adds an extra bit of context to the ending that I really actually appreciated. Uh, everyone's impressed, naturally. And Gary says the difference between the universe's battles was this. Two magicians, Mr. Sardo and the Lady in Black, but one's fake. And one's real. And I was like, Ooh. oh, that's kind of cool. That's kind of clever. Because, of course, then she would win out. Yeah. Uh, Gary then gives Frank, Eric, Betty Ann and Kiki a pair of the specs uh, to add some weight to the story. And here's a gift from me. Uh, but when they put them on, they see a person dressed in black, panic and run off screaming. Only one who doesn't is Kirsten, who compliments Gary on his prank and story. And the person in black is then revealed to be David in disguise, which I thought was a fun little scare for Gary to kind of get his own back and people as well. Um, and I think this is a great episode. I think it's fun. I think it's quite, it moves quite peppy. And I think there's some legit scares. I do think it's one of the more memorable episodes, obviously, because you've got the first appearance of Mr. Sardo and you've got the super specs, which I think, the object themselves, much like you know the camera from Sage's Inda or something, they're like a memorable prop from the show that is something you think of. And uh, yeah, I think considering what's come before it, this is definitely finally a step up, which is what we've been waiting for. And Gary delivered it, so good job, Gary. <laughs> yeah, great story from Gary. I think that's what I, I think the fact that it felt like imagination was used here. Uh, Chloe Brown, the writer, uh, used it was imaginative, and I get the impression that this was probably a script that was heavily cut down because of the confusing aspects near the end and clearly a lot of detail about alternative world. I'd imagine that was written. It was like, okay, this is not a 24 minute ep long episode. So lots of, been, lots of bits have been cut out here to try and make it fit the episode runtime. Yeah, you could see maybe some people having a bit of an issue with how complex and grand in scale is going. Maybe for like people that are watching it to really like grasp what they're talking about. But uh, I think they did a pretty good job of of doing it so it, it worked in the end i agree this gets our approval it is the tale of the super specs episode number six you've got any thoughts on it you know what to do let us know in the comments thank you very much for watching if you liked what you saw please help us out by giving us a thumbs up and hitting that subscribe button if you really liked what you saw consider donating to keep the website and channel running by buying us a coffee via our coffee page or picking up some merch from our big cartel store. You can check us out on gbhbell.com as well as via our social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as listen to our interviews via SoundCloud, Apple Music, and Spotify. Just search for GBHBL. Games, horror, and heavy metal. What else is life for?